Good morning. Well, I'm delighted to be back with you uh, today and uh, looking forward to engaging these, these topics. Certainly the, the politics of evaluation is uh, a, a longstanding issue near and dear to my heart. The, uh, I was president of the American Evaluation Association in 1988, which was also a presidential election year in the United States. And the, the only real thing that, that the president of the American Evaluation Association does is pick the theme for the annual conference. Um, and so the theme I picked that year was the politics of evaluation. Uh, that was, was uh, our theme in part because it was a, a, a presidential election year. And, and, but, but historically, and I, I shared some yesterday my sense of the history of the, of the profession, um, by the by the mid to late 80s, um, and this was a slower has been a slower process in the U.S. than it has been in 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 Europe, to be sure, because um, the history of evaluation coming out of research in the U.S. Uh, evaluation in in the U.S. was much slower to acknowledge the political nature of. Evaluation. It has always seemed to me that Europeans were more tuned into that right from the beginning and assumed that that was part of the, the landscape. But we had this um, sort of absurd value-free position around research that you could do this stuff uh, in a way that was non-political. And indeed, that's the way a lot of the early textbooks and programs were framed. But by the, by the late 80s, um, it was pretty well clear that evaluation was a political activity regardless of what the value-free researchers might hold forth. And in that coming of age of recognizing it was political, we actually, that year at the conference, turned the question on its head in a way, um, recognizing that evaluation was political. The, the issue that, that I posed, because we had in those days an essay contest that was part of the conference theme where the president got to pose a question of the membership that people wrote responses to, uh, and then we selected. And the question that I posed that year was given that, that evaluation is political, what aspects of evaluation are not political to keep it from being tautological? You know, when you say it's all political, then it begins to be relatively meaningless. So the question was what aspects or under what conditions, in what ways, is evaluation not political? And there were a number of essays selected, but the winning essay was, that I selected was quite short. And, and those of you who've seen utilization-focused evaluation, I reproduced it in there. Uh, I thought it was quite an elegant statement. Evaluation is not political under the following conditions, all of which must be met. No one cares about the program. <laughs> no one knows about the program. There is no money or power at stake in the program, and no one involved in the program in any way making decisions about the program or otherwise engaged in the program is sexually active. <laughs> if one meets all those conditions, then evaluation is not political. Otherwise, uh, it is. Um, and that sort of covers the territory, so it gives us a lot to, uh, a lot to, to deal with. Um, what I've created is, uh, with this uh, invitation is a, uh, a quick top 10 list of uh, hot topics in evaluation. So I'm going to do my top 10 list here. So I'll start it at the back. Um, the first are a set of issues around the, uh, the profession identity and status. Uh, we, uh, we had a um, major conference uh, in the last summer uh, honoring Michael Scriven's contributions to evaluation. And um, you know he's the one that gave us the formative summative distinction that set the stage for the discussion yesterday. But Scriven has been uh, on the forefront of pushing evaluation uh, as a transdiscipline, um, arguing that 
there are a small number of, of core trans disciplines that every other field depends on to do their work. Philosophy is the mother discipline. Um, statistics is a trans discipline that virtually every field uh, uses. Ethics is a trans discipline. And he argues that, that evaluation is a trans discipline because every other discipline depends upon evaluation. Peer review is, a, is an evaluation process, uh, one that's actually quite corrupt and not very valid or reliable, uh, but is at the core of how we determine what knowledge is. And so the, the status of, of evaluation, what it is as both a profession and a transdiscipline, um, and how to identify what this community constitutes is, um, is very much, I think, a hot issue and, and a developing one. Um, in, the, in the 1970s, the first three big evaluation associations, the Australasian, Canadian, and American, were founded. Uh, the European, uh, so the national, some of the national associations in Europe uh, emerged in the 80s, and the European society toward the end of the 80s. Um, AFRIA in 1999, the Latin American network. And there are now 85 national evaluation associations around the world, uh, the International Development Evaluation Association, IDEAS, and the new International Organization for Cooperation and Evaluation, which is the umbrella organization of all the national associations that is working on um, our identity as a profession. Um, at dinner last night, we were talking about the the uh, evaluation association in the Netherlands, which uh, does, at least part of the conversation was, appears to be more of an association of auditors than evaluators. Um, and so, uh, you know, th th that's something to pay attention to because one of the, uh, and, and um, uh, I've heard the story about uh, one of the important uh, leaders uh, of, administratively of evaluation in uh, the Netherlands who uh, at a public meeting said that he was surprised to find out that evaluation was a profession. Um, and so th those are the kind of issues because uh, part of one of, the, one of the things that one of the courses that I regularly teach in the Evaluators Institute is a course on evaluation consulting and, and uh, how to start a consulting business and, and be a consultant. And, um, one of the opening exercises I do in that course is to have each person pr do their elevator speech, um, you know, their 30-second speech about what they have to offer. If they are a consultant, if they find themselves in an elevator with a potential client, what would they say to them in 30 seconds? And then they report and we all give them feedback. And I, I've, uh, I do that workshop uh, at least once a year. And the pattern that I've noticed over and over again, and it's always my first piece of feedback, uh, there have probably been 200 or so people that I've done this exercise with, and none of them in their elevator speech ever include that I'm part of a profession. You know, they start explaining their methods or their specialization uh, or something, and m my elevator speech begins with, I'm part of a global profession that has standards, that has journals, um, that has professional development, uh, that has professional uh, associations, uh, that is a community of, of practice. Um, and so our identity um, and, and nurturing new evaluators as professionals, uh, I think how, uh, how we do that and the work here, the course, the course here, uh, because we do have standards. Um, and that is part of what a profession does. And we deal with ethical issues, and we deal with, as we are today, hot topics and debates and, and different perspectives. Um, so one of the issues that is a sub-issue here that is very hot right now is the issue then within a profession of certification and even licensure. Because unlike auditing, um, we have no exam. We have no way of deciding who is in and out. People self-designate. And so as you, um, as you probably know, uh, Canada 
has initiated, the Canadian Evaluation Society has initiated a very interesting voluntary certification program around essential skills. Um, New Zealand is doing the same, and Japan has a certification uh, program for evaluators uh, based upon work around uh, what uh, have been identified as essential skills. And so in Canada, Japan, and New Zealand, they're all using a essential skills framework uh, that my colleague in Minnesota, Gene King, has been heavily involved in researching that is attempting to really define what it means to be a professional. Uh, and one of the contributions of this framework is making it clear, unlike the beginnings of evaluation, um, at least uh, in, in my experience, began primarily with a heavy uh, emphasis upon uh, methodological expertise. Of the six essential skills, methodology is only one of the six. So that interpersonal communication skills uh, becomes very important. Uh, ethical sensitivities as an evaluator is a whole essential uh, skills. A sense of professional identity and adhering to standards becomes one of the essential skills. So uh, this to me is, is um, a very hot topic and it sounds like in the, the, the context of the Netherlands, how you take ownership of uh, and of what it means to be a professional evaluator uh, can be quite important. And it's, it is something that very few policymakers recognize as a profession, don't appreciate uh, the global uh, nature of it, and the large numbers of people uh, involved in this. And so I think that, that's a hot topic. Um, a second comes out of the work in utilization that I've done uh, with colleagues over the years, the attention to use. And the hot topic for me here is uh, we predicted, when I first started writing about use in the 1970s, the concern was uh, the, the re almost complete lack of, of use and inattention to evaluation. It's a very small field at that time. It was really before the profession emerged. But in the very first edition of utilization-focused evaluation, um, based upon conversations with people like Marv Alkin and Brad uh, Cousins and others are working on utilization. We predicted that um, if you think about a matrix that has use and misuse, we predicted that if use went up, misuse would go up. And we're seeing that at a huge level right now. And it relates to the professional issue because one of the hot issues for the profession is what do we do about the misuse of evaluation? Do we have a, a role as professionals? Imagine in the Netherlands context, as regularly happens certainly in, in the US, that, that some government official um, substantially misrepresents an evaluation report, uh, selectively cherry picks certain statistics and ignores others, provides an imbalanced view, or as US politicians do, simply outright lie about what the results are. Um, does the profession is there have the capability or the responsibility to create some kind of public response to dramatic misuse? I mean, it's so widespread, we, we'd all be full time to try to take it on in any meaningful way. But when does something arise to that occasion? The US, the very controversial, but, but AEA has now taken official stands on two major um, uh, issues in uh, public policy in the US. One is the misuse of mandates for randomized controlled trials uh, in government RFPs, and the second is high stakes tasting, testing and the negative effects and the distortions about uh, what can be done with testing. Both of those have been very controversial positions within AEA, but AEA has gone on the record about those things. But the bigger problem becomes the widespread, as, indeed, as use has gone up, um, misuse has gone up, which relates to a, a third trend that I know is a part of our discussion, was a big piece of it yesterday, and it is the, I would call it the politicalization of accountability.
the language, um, the rhetoric about accountability in the 60s and, and 70s, um, and I would use the Vietnam War as an example, the, uh, the Vietnam War was not a debate about indicators of progress, benchmarks, um, who is accountability, accountable for what. But when you look at the rhetoric around the Iraq War and the Afghanistan War, it is infused with evaluation language. The, the, the regular debates are about what are the indicators that we're winning or losing, and it's, uh, what the, the testimony before Congress just last week uh, with the generals, the, the Congress was asking them, what are the benchmarks that tell you that it's okay to leave? So the language of evaluation has become part of the political rhetoric. And the danger here is what happens when language becomes part of the general culture and part of political rhetoric is it loses most of its meaning. Uh, politicians are now running on platforms of accountability and trying to outdo each other on who is more insistent on motherhood and accountability uh, as twin goods. And they want um, to be strongly pro-accountability for everyone except, of course, themselves. Um, and so there's enormous hypocrisy around this demand for accountability. It's, it's safe, and it's relatively vacuous. So going back again to our responsibilities as, as professionals, how do we keep this terminology being meaningful and not just political rhetoric? How do we provide some, some substance which includes attending to the misuses of it and some historical substantive knowledge about the boundaries of accountability, what's possible and what's not possible, um, and what we've learned about the way in which accountability uh, gets corrupted. The political rhetoric includes stuff like evidence-based practice. And so part of the politics of this is that everywhere I go, anybody that has a belief system about anything calls it evidence-based. They've simply adopted this language. It doesn't mean there is evidence. It just means that evidence-based now has political cachet. And so if I want to make the case that uh, whatever position I may favor, uh, I call it evidence-based. And uh, military metaphors uh, are, and management metaphors are part of the language that we're having to deal with in evaluation. Sorting out these things, having them be real, uh, our trying to make them meaningful is one of the, the challenges so that this stuff doesn't just become vacuous. A, um, what number am I on here? I guess I'm on seven. Um, the relationship and this came up a lot yesterday, so I'm not going to dwell on it here, uh, between M and E is, uh, I think, very much a hot issue. And so a lot of the questions yesterday about developmental evaluation was, isn't it just a lot of, of good M with some occasional E? Um, and the, the relationship between the monitoring sides of the work, the evaluation sides of the work, as well as auditing and inspecting and the other kinds of functions and issues that came up yesterday about isn't this just good management. Um, the, the, the larger issue here is in, in some ways is that was much of our discussion yesterday is about the relationship among some of the different kinds of evaluation functions. The umbrella for that is the relationship between M and E. But the relationship between formative and summative and developmental. In the last edition of UFE, I identified 150 different approaches to evaluation, names for kinds of, of evaluations. And that is a, goes back to the issue around the um, professionalization piece of this is the big picture of E and M and E as a profession. And then as we get over here, we're starting to talk about the subparts of different kinds and different types. Um, I regularly get uh, phone calls from 
people uh, out of the blue, and I'll answer the phone, and they say, uh, uh, I answer Michael, I'm the, this is Michael Patton, and they say, are you, the, are you the patent that does evaluation? And I say, well, that, that is the rumor. How can I help you? And they say, we need one. And I say, well, what kind do you need? Kind? Yeah, I mean, you know, I say if you're going to go to a restaurant, you don't just go to a restaurant. You go to a kind of restaurant, Italian, Chinese, whatever. Or if you buy a car, you buy a kind of car. There are different kinds of evaluation. What kind are you looking for? And then they say, well, we have got this three-year grant from a philanthropic foundation, and it ends in two weeks, and we just notice we have to do an evaluation. And I say, I don't do that kind. Um, <laughs> Uh, but this whole relationship among different kinds, I think, is epitomized in some ways by the, relation, uh, the issue about the relationship between M and E. Um, six, this is the very much a part of what the, the three-week course here is ab about, and that is uh, the big issue of capacity building. And this is, this is not just the capacity building of evaluators, but a part of what we've learned um, is it's a capacity building of organizations to support evaluation, to use evaluation. Uh, some of you yesterday heard me talk about the leadership training I've done uh, with leaders of organizations to incorporate evaluative thinking into their responsibilities. Um, but basically what we've learned in the 40 years that we've been a profession uh, is that there's a, a lot uh, to build uh, a, a in capacity and that it's it's not easy or uh, straightforward to do evaluation. Uh, we had a, a, a t-shirt slogan bumper sticker contest at AEA one year, and the winning slogan uh, was, evaluation is an unnatural act. <laughs> Has some layers of meaning. Uh, <laughs> but, excuse me, the, but part of that was the capacity building this relates to the other themes, is about the whole notion uh, of what the field is, of what it means to engage in evaluative thinking, not just gathering some data, about the relationship between M and E as a, as a capacity, um, the capacity of, of people in developing countries, of organizations. All of this is, is a huge hot issue. Um, five is one that's near and dear to my heart, and I think we're just uh, beginning to understand the implications of this, um, is attention to process use. The, um, as I noted yesterday, the, the, I introduced the language of process use in the third edition of Utilization Focused Evaluation in, in 1997. And in the last decade, there've been, there's actually been a lot of research now uh, on process use and dissertations being done on it and people are looking at it. Process use has to do with the way in which the evaluation process uh, has an impact on the uh, effectiveness of programs quite apart from the findings. Our, all of our early work was on the use of findings and then we began to find um, that when you go through a logic modeling process with with an organization or program. It has an impact before any data are ever collected. When you select indicators under the notion of what gets measured gets done, that becomes a focusing exercise that tells people what's important and it affects what they, what they activities they take on them, what priorities they set. Well, those are examples of, of process use. And it relates to capacity building uh, in the sense that that as we build the capacity of organizations to engage in evaluation and in M&E more generally, we're then doing some of the things that came up yesterday. We're looking at the linkage between uh, more effective management and more effective evaluation. The leadership training that I did around uh, reality testing, results-oriented, accountability-focused leadership was capacity building with a heavy emphasis on process use. Uh, the work that, that uh, a lot of the work that I've been doing with uh, philanthropic leaders in the US is around strategic thinking from an evaluation perspective. 
And that really has a lot more to do with, with process use, attention to the ways in which thinking evaluatively has an impact quite apart from the findings. It doesn't devalue findings, but it acknowledges that we bring to the table a way of thinking about problems, analyzing things, framing things that has an impact for good or bad. That's part of the issue. Um, I'm not, a, I'm not saying this is necessarily all good. One of the, one of the keynotes at AEA three years ago by Sully Gariba from Africa, who was uh, the president of FREE at that time, was African ways of knowing in which he was concerned that there was a narrow definition of evaluative thinking that devalued certain other cultural kinds of perspectives. Um, and indeed, one of the trends I should note within professional identity is the cross-cultural piece of this. AEA, as many of you would know, just released this, uh, this year, after six years of work, a statement on cross-cultural competence to engage in evaluation. Uh, and with a, an acknowledgment that that there are inherently cultural issues involved in being an evaluator, which include issues of power and, and cultural difference, and that part of capacity building then is attention to cultural issues, and that those cultural perspectives are part of understanding what is generic evaluative thinking and what's quite specific contextual evaluative thinking as a, as a hot issue. So we're getting to the end of the list here. Number four um, is, a, is a, I think, quite a huge trend and um, uh, one that's, that for the younger folks will be less obvious than for us old timers who came from the days when evaluation was represented by big, thick printed reports. Um, and this trend is, is captured by the title of the book that Nicoletti Stam, uh, the, uh, uh, from Italy, and, and Ray Risk did in a book called From Studies to Streams. In evaluation, uh, originally produced reports often quite thick reports, uh, fairly academic reports. We're on the cusp of going out of the report writing business, uh, at least with a few exceptions. There will still be some big reports. But we're much more, and this is again the relationship between M and E, in, from studies to streams is about ongoing data collection, real-time data collection. It includes the use of the internet, social media, uh, the whole way in which uh, the, the speed of information, the rapid feedback, multiple data systems, and data systems that aren't controlled by evaluators. Um, uh, harvesting data from many uh, different sources, official and unofficial sources, so that the, the information age and all the different sources and, and types of information and the capacity to gather information from the internet and the ways in which new techniques are are emerging to uh, that include the uh, search engine uh, uh, ways of, of coding information and tracking things and and finding out what's what's going on is substantially changing the way in which we we deal with with data uh, and as well as simply what is demonstrably uh, certainly in the West and becoming a worldwide phenomenon of ever increasingly short attention spans. And that, that's, there's, there's interesting even neurological research on the way in which the information age is affecting how our brains organize information and the incapacity to focus, which means not being able to read a big report. And folks are now taxed to and, and find it a stretch to read a one-page executive summary. You know, give me three or four bullets uh, and I'm done with this. 
Paul? I was just going to point out the connection. There's a bit of a connection there also with the increasing focus on visualization. Well, that, that's a separate trend, but, okay, well, <laughs> but it is connected. Directly. It's another one, yeah. It's another one that I was gonna, going to, um, uh, to mention. Um, I've got that as number two, so we'll, but, but very much connected. You're anticipating it. Let me finish off here. Um, this, um, this one gets to the, is a version of the rigor piece that we're going to come to later. And uh, it's the, uh, the, the way in which the rigor piece has changed in, in my lifetime is that I came up through what in the early days and was an active participant in the, the qual, uh, quant debates. Um, that, the qual quant debate is really pretty well gone. Uh, and the uh, recognition that both qualitative and qualitative uh, data are, uh, are important and the trend toward mixed methods, um, triangulation, all of that. But what it's left in its stead is the issue of attribution. That's where the debate is now. It's not about qualitative and quantitative. It's about the relative importance of attribution versus contribution. Um, and, you know, within this is all the issues of uh, epistemological issues about the nature of knowledge, uh, issues of, of control, about how knowledge is generated, uh, about what is valuable, uh, the, all the gold standard stuff. Um, and so the, the debate has, has changed, and uh, it, it becomes important to recognize that these things do morph over time uh, so that, that the divisions probably around qualitative and quantitative reached their height in the early 1980s and for a while were actually quite nasty and quite personal. There's some very, very nasty exchanges uh, in, in the literature where, where people's uh, uh, genetic heritage were questioned uh, in, uh, and their, their basic mental faculties uh, were challenged to, to think in, in certain ways. Um, that reached its height when Lee Seacrest and Ivana Lincoln were subsequent presidents of the American Evaluation Association. Lee was a hardcore quant. Ivana Lincoln was a hardcore qual. And it was nasty uh, and very personal. So um, from that point on, in fact, I think the nastiness of that uh, was so embarrassing and, and shocking to people that that began to pull us back towards we've got to get less crazy about this stuff. And it's not a matter of, uh, of basic personal uh, integrity and, and intelligence, uh, but has to do with some other stuff. But it has morphed into this, which is, is actually a, a, a much softer debate, um, which makes it a little harder. And it's much more like what uh, Irene was describing of um, this acknowledging that there are multiple methods and that they all have value. It's just that one set is the real ones and the other set is the other ones, but they're all good except that one's the gold standard and everything else is not the gold standard. And so, uh, you know, we get, we get a bit of this uh, game playing with exactly what, what the rigor piece means. And we'll have a good chance to talk about that in the morning. So number two, Paula has anticipated, um, is definitely, as, as she said, linked to the Internet and all of that. But it, it has to do with the nature of reporting the increased uh, attention to visualization, mapping, uh, video, photos, um, streaming, and even uh, there's a, a whole arena here that has emerged. It was a, the feature of a plenary at AEA three years ago, Jennifer Green, last year's president, very much involved in it, that includes um, using artistic approaches, um, artistic and evocative approaches for evaluation, both data collection and, and reporting. So that uh, I've been involved in, Jennifer has, a, a Patricia Rogers has, um, in presenting evaluation uh, findings as plays, as dramas, to 
to try to get stakeholders engaged in a, uh, a, a different way. Uh, the, the, probably the most widespread example of that kind of reporting of research uh, is the vagina monologues. Have some of you seen the vagina monologues? You know, that, that's an example of research findings that were turned into a play that's, that's uh, been very dramatic, 30 uh, short scenarios of different women's experiences of coming of age sexually told in dramatic fashion. Um, and so we're doing that with evaluation reports, taking the, the nuggets and acting them out. Um, I've seen evaluation reports written as poems, um, presented as, uh, uh, as documentary dramas. So we're exploring as well as all the stuff that's going on with visualization that's, that's just taking off like crazy. And finally uh, is number one, <laughs> systems and complexity. Now why would I put that first? I wonder. Confirmation bias. Confirmation bias. We'll make that number one plus, confirmation bias. Uh, uh, one, of the, one of the ways to track hot trends that, that I use to track hot trends is, is uh, the emergence of new topical interest groups in AEA. As, as those of you who uh, have some familiarity with AEA, it's organized into affinity groups. People have a shared interest, topical interest groups. So there's people interested in evaluation use. There's a qualitative TIG. There's a quantitative TIG. There's a theory TIG. Um, there's an independent consultant TIG. Uh, there's an evaluation use TIG. And as new TIGs get formed, it tells you that enough new people interested in an issue um, have gotten together to want to name themselves and begin to uh, have a part of the AEA program. Because once you become a TIG, that the AEA program is organized by the TIGs. And any given session, any, any given time during the three-day conference, you'll find topics on that TIG. And the TIGs are the ones that actually choose which, which sessions get done. The most recent TIG, um, the latest TIG, is the visualization TIG. They were just formed this year. So there's now a TIG on the visual reporting of data. One of the most recent uh, TIGs is the systems um, and complexity uh, TIG. Uh, it's probably four years old. There's a, um, a new TIG on advocacy evaluation. I know there's some folks working with that here. And um, that became a big enough group to, uh, to, to come together. So that's one of the ways to kind of track hot trends. And, we spent yesterday talking about this, so I won't belabor that. But a part of what's, what is uh, uh, within this that I think is germane, worth mentioning, is that this does direct us toward different units of analysis. That is, as I said over and over yesterday, that evaluation grew up in the projects. We have a project mentality, a kind of bounded system mentality, our methods and our conceptualizations and our logic models and everything else pretty much come out of that. And so what systems and complexity has partly done is both a response to and is driving thinking about other units of analysis, which include changing systems uh, as a unit of analysis. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, I did a, a volume of new directions in evaluation, which is another way of tracking trends. Well, Patty Patrizzi and I did a volume on um, evaluating strategy where we treated strategy as a unit of analysis. And that was a response to the CEOs of major philanthropic foundations and their directors of evaluation. We have a, a group that gets together 18, every 18 months of major uh, directors of evaluation for the large philanthropic foundations, and that's always organized around the issues that they're facing. And the boards of these foundations and their CEOs were no longer interested in evaluation of grants or even clusters of grants. They were all going to workshops where CEOs were supposed to uh, articulate and boards were supposed to approve strategies, and they wanted to know how do we evaluate the effectiveness of our strategies. Strategy is a different unit of analysis. 
And that's what the big picture folks were asking. And these evaluators, very methodologically sophisticated, very well qualified, very high capacity, were at a loss of what, how do you go about evaluating a strategy. It's a different, uh, different unit of analysis, and it requires systems and complexity understandings to get it there. So that's my top ten list. Thank you. Thank you.